Welcome back to Night School, Episode 8, Song of Myself, Part 5, back with my esteemed colleague, Mr. Wesley Shass. Welcome back, Mr. Shass. Hey. How are you back. doing? It's good to have you. It's good to have you. And Well, right to it tonight. So we were thinking about starting at 14, the second quarter of this uh, four-seasonal poem, potentially this 52 part, this 52-week-long poem. Well, let's see what this week has in store. And I think you were saying in the pre-show that it's my turn to read first. Yeah, I think you got evens. All right, evens. Oh, that's a good way of thinking about it. It's funny how when you see the pattern behind a piece, a, a seemingly disparate piece of information or fact, often that is what enables you to memorize the fact. Yeah. So that's, that's very interesting. Perhaps we will find a pattern or a theme in this that will help us to understand and remember Song of Myself better, and perhaps we will then know ourselves better afterwards. Hmm. Yeah. Speaking of, the wild gander leads his flock through the cool night. Ya honk, he says, and sounds it down to me like an invitation. The pert may suppose it meaningless, but I, listening close, find its purpose and place up there toward the wintry sky. The sharp-hoofed mouse of the north, the cat on the house sill, the chickadee, the prairie dog, the litter of the grunting sow as they tug at her teats, the brood of the turkey hen, and she with her half-spread wings. I see in them and myself the same old law. The press of my foot to the earth springs a hundred affections. They scorn the best I can do to relate them. I'm enamored of growing outdoors, of men that live among cattle or taste of the ocean or woods, of the builders and steerers of ships, and the wielders of axes and mauls, and the drivers of horses. I can eat and sleep with them week in and week out. What is commonest, cheapest, nearest, easiest is me. Me going in for my chances, spending for vast returns, adorning myself to know or to bestow, excuse me, myself on the first that will take me, not asking the sky to come down to my goodwill, scattering it freely forever. And I'll share this screen with those of you following on YouTube now. All right, Wes, what'd you think? I liked your you honk a lot. That's Thank good. you. Yeah, that, I remember looking forward to that last time. Yeah, yeah, so so we start out with the animals, it seems like for um, the first being the, the, the gander, right? And uh, I guess that would make you think of the old idiom, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Um, so, and we have this kind of idea going on in the next stanza too, because it's all, it's animals, but it's more than that. It's also um, leadership and how leadership is connected to mating. It seems like you got the um, the litter and the sow, the brood and the turkey hen, and so he sees himself in them, and he sees himself the same old law. Right, so that um, his connection to the animals, right? He's he's one of them in some sense, and that they are all uh, obeying some some deeper law of nature there, right? Um, and then he kind of shifts it to back to human beings again, uh, and again, it's in terms of his deep um, affection. Right, this this kind of uh, elation that he has as he thinks about or or sings about all these different um, possible friends, I suppose, right? People to eat and sleep with, um, co-workers, builders, um, cowboys, right? Sailors it seems to be any and all of them, right? Are again connected to him, and uh, and his his outlay of, of affection, um, he puts it in terms of economics here, right? Going in for my chances, spending for vast returns. It's his kind of investment, right, of, uh, of himself. And on the other hand, right, he doesn't expect to be um, exempt from whatever that law is, which I take to mean that includes, you know, loss and death and, and all that side of it too, right? He's, he's willing to, to accept that as well. And that last line there, scattering it freely forever, uh, makes it sound like he, he isn't like calculating in this. He's just 
freely, as it says, you know, um, bestowing himself here. It's it's a really uh, it's really out there. He's he's really putting himself out there. It's awesome. Yeah, and I I'd say I find three things interesting about this uh, part besides what you've said, which I think was a very strong elucidation. Is that middle stanza where he injects himself seems to tie that which is human nature to that which is nature nature, suggesting that our human nature it comes from nature or is part of nature, sort of like. Uh, recent neuroscientists suggested that religions are actually evolved social structures from social animals. So they're, they, like nation states, are the highest manifestation of society. And you might take his evidence for that, the fact that you care about people and will follow the law with people and not harm them who are not blood related to you without even batting an eyebrow, especially as a teacher. Very sort of interesting idea. But um, he injects himself between as if he is connecting humans and animals through his articulation or as if a human is a connection of that thing which works and has to use its conscious will and those things which simply do and that perhaps there's some notion that the best human life or the most natural in accordance with human nature is to use one's human will to do that which one would do purely by instinct um, if one could without having a conscious will, right? Because if you were just instinct, you'd do a bunch of crazy things and you'd die very quickly. Um, but if you were to do that, which would be best in each possible situation, which I think is precisely the trick. But he, in this stanza, he says, the press of my foot to the earth springs a hundred affections. They scorn the best I can do to relate them. Who is the they? Because I take that as people, suggesting that regardless of the description of people, they're so multifaceted and multivaried that they're ineffable, like God. It is impossible to describe them entirely, but that they, like him, are subject to an old law. And I was wondering whether, and I, I saw that you interpreted that as nature. I saw it also as nature, but also I wondered, did you, could it also be the Old Testament? Or did you see it in that way as all, at all? Because that old law expression it's just very provocative. Of course, the Old Testament is called the law, and it is called the Old Testament, and he is very much versed in that. Um, uh, beyond that, I there was one other thing. What was it? What was it? Um, oh, yes, the part may suppose it meaningless. When he says that he can, by looking at birds, understand something about nature, which they are saying, he's not being Buddhist, as somebody might suppose. He's actually uh, putting himself in the prophetic epic tradition. Something that um, prophets do in both Virgil and in um, Homer and do in hell for Dante is that they, they can predict the current situation and that which is in the immediate future by means of bird signs. And so what I teach the students that means is the prophets are the people that can see the details of a situation and put together the big picture and other people don't understand how that works. They just understand the big picture, which is generally right. Uh, what Whitman seems to be doing here is saying that, like, you know, you don't need to be listening to the meaningless words that people are speaking around you. You need to be looking at things how actually how things actually work. And I'll try and represent that in this poem, but it'll be impossible because you're too complicated. But um, that's what I do because that's my nature. So I'm going to scatter it how I want forever. And it's interesting because that also smacks it slightly of defiance, right? just in his representation of the male physical form with like the adoration of a lover rather than simply like a competitor. He also says, well, even if this is sort of a doomed to fail endeavor, I'm free so I can do what I want. So welcome to American poetry. Welcome. Yeah. So I, I think the same old law, I, it's in, again, it's in one of those kind of idiomatic expressions there. The yeah. same old the same old, same old, right? It's it yeah. could be, it could be alluding to the Old Testament um, laws to do with, you know, a people, and in some sense, I guess Whitman is putting together a kind of, as you say, a prophetic um, poem for America, you know, in some ways. But I, I and I, I don't know if I I'd go that far with that one, but. In the next, yeah, the, I do agree that the short stanza here is kind of joining these worlds, and I think that what he's what he's talking about in terms of the they there is just the affections. 
Ah. And, and the affections themselves, like you say, are, are escaping his ability to relate, um, meaning to tell, right? To right. pass on. And that but ties I, back nicely, and you actually set me up for this, uh, to the notion that what the poet attempts to do is embody the personalities that go with each primary motivational system, which I listed under the last, um, the last YouTube or Anchor video because I can't memorize them all. I think it's fear, panic, seeking, um, mating, and there are a few others that are also very basic. And so even portraying one of those personalities, like the lover, for example, who certainly is a personality, is impossible. And so, yeah, was that what you were alluding to last time that would support the point that I was very broadly and making? I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, um, the relating, right, he's, he's speaking primarily to people and we share all of those basic um, urges and whatnot with the animals, but we're different insofar as we have articulate speech, yeah, and, and you know, and recognize the law consciously, as you say, not simply instinctively, and will it, and that's very different. Right. Uh, or, or, you know, will not to do it, I guess, also. Right, yeah. right. And, um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I do think if we were just talking directly to the teachers and students here, part of what you said about the old law being nature rather than simply the Old Testament or saying Old Testament would certainly be second to nature would be using the immediate context before, right? All the images are of nature. And so just as a sort of a lesson to those observing, Wes's point is clearly correct based on everything in the stanza before, I would say. Though there might be a little bit of what I was suggesting, but not much. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, Okay, yeah, no, I, I wanted to say maybe a little bit more, but um, I think we've, uh, you know, I think we've done this, this uh, first part of the second season well. Uh, oh, yeah, I was good, also just going to mention the repetition at the beginning of the lines. It might be interesting to note that for somebody uh, reading for literary devices, not that I necessarily recommend that, but each stanza except for the last one has a repetition or two. Um, the and the in the first, the, the, the in the second, the, the, or the, they, and the second, the same sound. Um, I in, in the first, and then I in the last, and the of, of in the middle. Um, interesting sort of figure. And then what me adorning, not scattering. Something interesting there. Um, no, no repetition. Well, do you, do you see anything in that, Wes? I mean, I think Whitman, as you, as you read more of him, I think you see a lot of his tendency to uh to kind of list right and to enumerate yeah. and so i think that's where a lot of the repetition kind of comes in and that's kind of the the way that he uses it is and and then so then it sort of stands out like you say when he doesn't do that when he has a kind of um self-contained thought that isn't a list of, of some kind um it sort of stands out, and I think it's really effective, especially, like I said, I, I think that last, that last line, scattering it freely forever, um, has a, a stickiness to it, you know? That's going to stick in your mind. Um, yeah, and there's just a deep humility to it at the beginning. It goes from the dirt to the heavens, as it were. What's commonest, cheapest, nearest, easiest is me, that humility. So it allows mm -hmm. him to accrue all experience to himself, right? That's why the rich man can't pass through the eye of the, the needle or rather it'd be easier for him to pass through the eye of the needle than go to the kingdom of heaven because all he sees is like his riches right but mm -hmm. the real riches are reality and how it works nature it's what whitman seems to be claiming that i would agree with that everything around you is the most interesting thing ever um because humans made it or if it's nature it's even more interesting because it actually works yeah um, yeah yeah like trees like you know they grow by themselves there's much to be learned from them and that seems to be part of what Whitman is saying in this sort of return to nature, though he's not turning from humans. He's making, I think, a bridge mm -hmm. of himself. Yeah. And scattering it freely forever. Um, I, I like that too, because it seems to be that what the heavenly life would mean for a human is following his will or, you know, and willing to do something freely 
and mm -hmm. not expecting it just to happen for him, like with an external locus of control. Um, not waiting for Godot, not waiting for Jesus, like being like doing so, or, you know, putting the seeds in the ground that one will sow. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is that sower, I sort of imagery with scattering it, right? Freely Absolutely. Forever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so here you go, scattering. All right. <laughs> and oh, man. Speaking of this. Wow. Yeah. All right. So 15. Pure contralto sings in the organ loft. The carpenter dresses his plank. The tongue of his foreplane whistles its wild ascending lisp. The married and unmarried children ride home to their Thanksgiving dinner. The pilot seizes the kingpin. He heaves down with a strong arm. The mate stands braced in the whaleboat, lance and harpoon are ready. The duck shooter walks by silent and cautious stretches. The deacons are ordained and with crossed hands at the altar. The spinning girl retreats and advances to the hum of the big wheel. The farmer stops by the bars as he walks on a first day loaf and looks at the oats and rye. The lunatic is carried at last to the asylum in a confirmed, a, a confirmed case. He will never sleep any more as he did in the cot in his mother's bedroom. The jor printer with gray head and gaunt jaws works at his case. He turns his quid of tobacco while his eyes blur with the manuscript. The malformed limbs are tied to the surgeon's table. What is removed drops horribly. The droon girl is sold at the auction stand. The drunkard nods by the barroom stove. The machinist rolls up his sleeves. The policeman travels his beat. The gatekeeper marks who pass. The young fellow drives the express wagon. I love him, though I do not know him. The half-breed straps on his light boots to compete in the race. The western turkey shooting draws old and young. Some lean on their rifles, some sit on logs. Out from the crowd steps the marksman, takes his position, levels his piece. The groups of newly come immigrants cover the wharf or levee. As the woolly pates hoe in the sugar field, the overseer views them from his saddle. The bugle calls in the ballroom. The gentlemen run for their partners. The dancers bow to each other. The youth lies awake in the cedar-roofed garret and harks to the musical rain. The wolverine sets traps on the creek that helps fill the Huron. The squaw wrapped in her yellow-hemmed cloth is offering moccasins and bead bags for sale. The connoisseur peers along the exhibition gallery with, with half-shut eyes bent sideways. As the deckhands make fast the steamboat, the plank is thrown for the shore-going passengers. The young sister holds out the scheme while the elder sister winds it off in a ball and stops now and then for the knots. The one-year wife is recovering and happy, having a week ago born her first child. The clean-haired Yankee girl works with her sewing machine or in the factory or mill. The paving man leans on his two-handed rammer. The reporter's lead flies swiftly over the notebook. The sign painter is lettering with blue and gold. The canal boy trots on the towpath. The bookkeeper counts at his desk. The shoemaker waxes his thread. The conductor beats time for the band and all the performers follow him. The child is baptized. The convert is making his first professions. The regatta is spread on the bay. The race has begun. How the white sails sparkle. The drover watching his drove stings out to them that would stray. The peddler sweats with his pack on his back. The purchaser higgling about the odd scent. The bride unrumples her white dress. The minute hand of the clock moves slowly. The opium eater reclines with rigid head and just opened lips. The prostitute draggles her shawl, her bonnet bobs on her tipsy and pimpled neck. The crowd laugh at her blackguard oaths. The men jeer and wink to each other. Miserable, I do not laugh at your oaths nor jeer you. The president holding a cabinet council is surrounded by the great secretaries. On the piazza walk three matrons stately and friendly with twined arms. The crew of the fish smack pack repeated layers of halibut in the hold. The Missourian crosses the plains, toting his wares and his cattle. As the fare collector goes through the train, he gives notice by the jingling of loose change. The floor men are laying the floor. The tinners are tinning the roof. The masons are calling for mortal mortar. In single file, each shouldering his hod pass onward the laborers. Seasons pursuing each other. The indescribable crowd is gathered. It is the fourth of seven months. What salutes of cannon and small arms. Seasons pursuing each other, the plower plows, the mower mows, and the winter grain falls in the ground. 
Off on the lakes, the pike fisher watches and waits by the hole in the frozen surface. Stumps stand thick round the clearing. The squatter strikes deep with his axe. Flat boatmen make fast towards dusk near the cottonwood or pecan trees. Coon seekers go through the regions of the Red River or through those drained by the Tennessee or through those of the Arkansas. Torches shine in the dark that hangs on the Chattahoochee or Altamaha. Patriarchs sit at supper with sons and grandsons and great-grandsons around them. And walls of adobe and canvas tents rest hunters and trappers after their day's sport. The city sleeps and the country sleeps. The living sleep for their time. The dead sleep for their time. The old husband sleeps by his wife and the young husband sleeps by his wife. And these tend inward to me and I tend outward to them. And such as it is to be of these, more or less I am. And of these one and all, I weave the song of myself. All right, so I, I'm not so happy that he has those last two lines of interpretation because I think, uh, and I'll suggest this as a way to interpret this very long um, part to the reader that he actually makes that fairly clear. Um, so this is obviously a very long list. And so two things about it. Thematically, you can justify potentially reducing your broadest level of interpretation to one here and not focus on all the specific details because of the thes. Obviously, the, 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 all these lines are starting with the. They're all connected together by first line by the fact or by first word and by the fact that they are all listing. And so they are a list of something. So what is this a list of? This is a response to 14, I think. What's commonest, cheapest, nearest, easiest is me. So we know this is him. So he doesn't need to tell us at the end. Um, because we know that he's doing that. But then I think it's also an invitation to, uh, uh, to remember not to miss the details because the details themselves, each specific line, each specific repetition of the, which you start to sort of ignore, right? Which is part of what he's trying to suggest about the details of life. Um, that's what life is made of, just as that's what the poem is made of. The poem is made of these lines that are each individual and different, just as your life is made of days or experiences that are, you know, in some way connected, but unique also. Uh, and that that forms the song of yourself in the way that notes form a song in conjunction with each other in the same way that lines form a poem in conjunction with each other. Um, in sort of typical American fashion, and he has sort of that fascistic corporate uh, thematic element in the beginning, that the, but is also deeply individual in terms of his line. So there's some, there's a deep unity here. So I suppose it's not only a life, but the life of an American as well. Um, and so I would also suggest that manner of interpretation for somebody teaching this for the first time, uh, because uh, if you really go line by line in this, in this uh, particular part, I think you might be wading through sand for days. Um, that, that said, what do you think, Wes? Yeah, I'd agree. It it would maybe be a challenge to try to find the the reason for one line following the next. Uh, in this case, they seem to defy any particular pattern or um, line line of thinking, right? Other than to just pile on, and and that's the effect, right? Is that it sort of rolls over you with this great this one long sentence, I mean, um, punctuation wise, there's no, there's no period until the very end of this um, list, you know, and there are some lines that he seems to comment upon, right? He breaks in with parentheses a few times to, to comment directly um, about what he's discussing. Uh, just, I think, to kind of remind you like you say, that, that he's there in all of them, you know, and in some sense, he's like modeling for you how to, how to do this, how to um, seize upon the lines that you particularly might want to talk about, right, and comment upon them and feel free to do that, right, but it's, it's overall this impression of, of the, the force of all of these things washing over you until that last kind of breath that you get, um, where he does sort of zoom back out and give you those sort of explanation or, or um, caption lines at the end there that, you know, rehash for you again, the, the title of the overall. Poem.
poem, right? Uh, he he makes it yeah really clear uh, that this is a kind of really obvious expression of what he's been doing all along. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think it goes from being what I would have called clear without those last two lines to obvious, like you described it. Because it's obvious from its, well, and why is it obvious without those last two lines? The sense of repetition with the, it gives an epic scope as well, because an epic convention is having a long list. The Catalog of Ships starts that tradition in the Iliad in book two. The Aeneid continues it strong with the Catalog of, of Latin warriors who come to the aid of Latinus, um, King Latinus and uh, uh, Pier, or excuse me, oh no, I'm forgetting the great enemy uh, Termus. There we are. Um, and also, I forget where it is in Dante's Inferno that he gives a great list. Or, and he may wait until the Paradiso. And he does give a couple, but they're not coming to my mind right now. But lists are epic. Um, and so this is him attempting to be epic, like, uh, like uh, we've been suggesting all along. But uh, I, I think just the scope of it, the length, it's so long it does draw your attention to it. It's huge. It's like the Hagrid of lines and um, except for maybe better order. And so in, in interpreting it in looking at it itself, it, it speaks for itself. Um, and so I almost feel as if Whitman sort of jumps out of the poetic mode in order to sort of make you appreciate him for what he's doing. Like he's forcing a compliment with those last two lines. Um, even though I know they're not totally out of place. Yeah, I, I, I think he, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think though that he's maybe trying to find a way to, to conclude the yes. the long you know section, yeah. and and he hits upon that as a way to do it to just kind of bring it back to the, um, the the thread of the entire poem. And but sure enough, you know, this next one is super long too. I don't know. Uh, we are at um, quite the same kind of thing, though. All right, all right. Well, uh, let's get ready here. Um, I am of old and young, of the foolish as much as the wise, regardless of others, ever regardful of others, maternal as well as paternal, a child as well as a man, stuffed with the stuff that is coarse and stuffed with the stuff that is fine, one of the nation of many nations, the smallest, the same, and the largest, the same, a southerner, soon as a northerner, a planter nonchalant and hospitable, down by the Oconee I live, a Yankee bound my own way, ready for trade, my joints the limberest joints on earth and the sternest joints on earth, a Kentuckian walking the vale of the Elkhorn in my deerskin leggings, a Louisianan or Georgian, a boatman over lakes or bays or along coasts, a Hoosier, Badger, Buckeye, at home on Canadian snowshoes or up in the bush or with fishermen off Newfoundland at home in the fleet of ice boats, sailing with the rest and tacking, at home on the hills of Vermont, or in the woods of Maine, or the Texan ranch, comrade of Californians, comrade of free Northwesterners, loving their big proportions, comrade of Rathsmen and Colvin, comrade of all who shake hands and welcome to drink and meet, a learner with the simplest, a teacher of the thoughtfulest, a novice, beginning yet experience of myriads of seasons, of every hue and cast in life, of every rank and religion, a farmer, mechanic, artist, gentleman, sailor, Quaker, prisoner, fancy man, rowdy, lawyer, physician, priest. I resist anything better than my own diversity. Breathe the air, but leave plenty after me. I am not stuck up and am in my place. The moth and the fish eggs are in their place. The bright suns I see and the dark suns I cannot see are in their place. The palpable is in its place, the impalpable in its place yeah nice it's so it's again a it's a kind of list but this time he's yeah making the boast that he is a uh, part and parcel of all of these things um and so it's kind of like working out the other direction right you have that imagery of inward and outward right at the end of 15 and he's sort of he's kind of working his way outward again from the i and the i am to embrace all of these specific places they're all they all seem to be places right and nicknames of people and um and descriptions of people from those places and then he kind of by that 
brings him back to this more abstract notion of place at the end. And so the parenthetical here, well, he has a few as you go along, I suppose, but the but the long one that sort of get gets your attention is when he has zoomed so far out that we're we're talking about moth and fish eggs and bright suns and dark suns and the palpable. So something so abstract, it's just that that which can be touched or felt, right? And that which is impalpable. And these are both in in their places as well. And so he, you know, he makes his bid to be equivalent to or or part of all of these people and then by extension all of the places where they're from and then by extension with like place itself like the proper i don't know location not just spatially but conceptually and um metaphysically perhaps right of of any substance or anything you could possibly name uh things you can feel and things you can't even uh sense right right it's it's again it gets really uh cosmic there by the end although it starts by being so concrete yeah and he uh he really even sort of does that with the poem right going from his own experiences to sort of job titles which are like descriptions of experiences in a word to considering the place of things far outside our experience like moth and fish eggs but still living but then bright suns, and then the dark suns we can't see, and then just that which we can touch or feel in some way, and then even that which we can't feel. I think he lays out nicely sort of the existentialist idea of what reality is and also what it sort of takes intelligence to deal with. Like, the, fur the farther your intelligence can go, the faster it is, the farther out from normal human experience it can travel um, into space, as it were, which is just a, which is equivalently abstract to place. Um, and so what, what, what you seem to see here is that just as a poem can go from human experience and that which is very rich and full, when you think of like, like a woodsman cutting a tree, that's a very rich image that you can uh, empathize or sympathize with to some extent. But when you think about that which is palpable and then change to that which is impalpable, it shows you, I think, also the range of things that exist that are outside of human experience and that there is so much outside of it, um, including moth and fish eggs experience and suns and stars and we're just seeing the scope and then bang, a concept even bigger than all of them, the impalpable, which is sort of like what? God, the unknown mover of the universe, that which we can't even sense and that actually probably that's most of the universe and our human experience is this tiny itty, itsy bitsy bit of it um, is sort of what I thought I saw him saying here as well. And so, yeah, so at the end of this boast, we get that, that note of humility struck again. And, and he does that too with the line about, right, I breathe the air, but leave plenty after me. <laughs> so <it's, Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks Whitman. Thanks for leaving us some air to breathe. Okay. Yeah, that's very nice. It's it's. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of humor in this poem, and um, and I think some of it is perhaps not intentional. Right? <laughs> it comes out of out of the uh, the swings and and lurches of the tone at times, but but some of it is definitely intentional, and uh, I think we're supposed to be kind of having a have a good having a good time with this, which I I certainly am. I I appreciate getting to pick this up every few days and chip away at it. Yeah, yeah, as, as do I. And it's funny, as you say that, I see just two interesting little epic conventions stuck in there. Um, the, the fact of breathe or respiration is tied to inspiration and the muse speaking through. And so breathe the air, which he needs to speak the words that are his poem leave plenty after me he's suggesting that he's taking his place but others can take their place behind him in time um just as dante does um with the epic poets of the past in the inferno just as virgil does by mimicking and changing the conventions of homer so he's taking his place which is both an epic thing to do and an american territorial thing to do it, which is why he adds, I think, I'm not stuck up 
But what's interesting is that he is taking a high and rich place that it is an honor to be. And so he's just doing what he's meant to do, which is his nature. And he's just doing the American thing to do, which is being free. But he still seems to be sort of um, uh, gawking at his own endeavor uh, uh, but while he does that. He's like, it's okay for me to do this. He seems to be self-justifying it, just as Dante does, which is an epic convention. But it is funny that he is very conscious of what it is he is doing and is conscious to sort of lay out his his thinking about how he is doing, what he is doing as he is doing it. Um, yeah. It's like he's yeah, reaching I, for the lamp. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like the, the image of the air there as relating to inspiration. And it also, it does seem to be um, a, a bit Dantesque uh, insofar as the movement um, of Dante is similarly from the low to the stars, right? And that's kind of the movement we get just in those couple of little stanzas there, right? Um, from where he's at, which looks like it might be kind of low, but then it turns out, whoa, it's it's actually among among the dark and the bright suns. So it's yeah, he's he's got range. I think that's what he means by his diversity. Mm -hmm. the human itself is very diverse in its experience and thoughts. And that it can have experiences based on its thoughts and experiences based on its thoughts about experiences and make additional connections. And that just exploring itself, which is sort of what one is doing while one reads another person's consciousness, right, is, is seeing just how much is packed into you, how complex you are, and that it is important for you as a free and sort yeah. of articulate well, creature to know what you can be. Right, right. I, I find it, yeah, the way that he says that about his own diversity, that he lays claim to all of these people and places, um, and then sort of sums that up in his own, his own place. It's, it's interesting how emphatic the, the possessives are there. Yes. Right? Um, and so, yeah, to, to, to talk about it in terms of uh, territory, uh, that's an interesting... Um, kind of note to strike there uh and i think that may that may well be a a kind of a, a tension in this poem a little bit right that to 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 wonder to what extent all of this does belong to him right in what sense is it his is it his um and and that's right there in the word myself right uh the song of myself um to what extent is that self just his Right. To what extent is he, in some sense, belonging to this this larger um, system or order? Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and how much thing is in the he song. That? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Because because and yeah, what I was wondering when you said that is because he leaves unclear the subject of the poem. Who mm -hmm. or I mean, I guess it is the song of himself. But who sings the song of myself? I think <laughs> what you have you originally think is him. But myself is the object of that preposition. It's objective, which means recipient, uh, not, not giver of action. So I sing the song of myself. That is what he says at the beginning in the poem. But mm -hmm. the title is Song of Myself, which, you know, I think that's a little more appropriate given his ideas about nature and how subject to nature we all happen to be in. Perhaps being within, say, a larger sort of eco, eco or social ecosystem that, mm -hmm. um, you know, to what extent are you yourself a a song, just a note in a larger system that works with you, um, and that it's it's appropriate for you to take your place, your grand place, because if you are grand, you make your people and your place grander, and that's part of it too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who's to say that the palpable stays palpable and the impalpable? stays palpable right uh, when you when you start to poke and prod at them maybe you extend the sphere of the palpable or vice versa that's right that's right we have we have far territory to roam yet i think is what whitman is reminding us of even though it's not as simple as when we simply had green fields ahead of us or a giant sea um and some people seem to be treating space in that way um i think i think 
what a human actually is in its domain of territory and what that actually is, is I think a far more fascinating and fruitful question. I think we're trying to answer that too. All right on. Well, All right. Well, night school and deep night scholars. All right. Well, another great time, Mr. Wesley Chance, and I'm looking forward to doing it again. Yep. Well, see you tomorrow for Harry Potter, I hope. See you tomorrow for Harry Potter. All right. Later.